Doing business internationally can be risky business. Along with the credit risks, there can be non-credit risks of which exporters should be aware. We've put together a series of small videos with tips to help you navigate the international markets. I'm here with Peter Dent, partner at Deloitte and Chair of Transparency International Canada. Thanks for joining us, Peter. Thank you. Today we're here to talk about corruption and bribery. Peter, I have to say, when I talk with exporters and I talk about corruption and bribery, I don't know if my definition and their definition matches up. Can you talk about what corruption and bribery is? It's a, it's a bigger question than many people realize. For the purposes of our discussion today, I think it's, it's important for us to define corruption and bribery as that involving public sector officials. So if we're talking about corruption and bribery involving public officials, then we're talking about any sort of inappropriate transaction with them in order to gain some sort of favor or benefit from them. It doesn't have to be money. It could be gifts, it could be favors, it could be anything that gets them to do something for you that they would not ordinarily be responsible to do. And why the focus on public officials? Why do we talk about public officials in relation to corruption and bribery more often than, let's say, gifts between two CEOs? Well, because public money is at risk. And so, therefore, there's a much greater focus on public sector corruption. And there's a lot more legislation around the world that is focused on public sector corruption than there is on private sector gifts or corruption or business dealings. So do we have a sense of how prevalent corruption and bribery is, either within the Canadian space, Canadian exporters going overseas, or internationally? There's no good way to measure how much corruption is out there. We only have a best guess. So Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index is a good way of measuring the amount of corruption by geography. But it's not perfect. Corruption exists everywhere. It isn't, it's perhaps in many jurisdictions less or less prevalent or less noticeable and in, more, in other jurisdictions more obvious. But it, it does exist in every jurisdiction around the world. That's an excellent point to make. So often when I'm talking with small or medium-sized companies, they just want to know which are the worst countries in terms of corruption and bribery, as if other countries don't have risks associated with it. Can you talk a little bit about some higher risk countries where there's more prevalence, uh, but also within the context of, of where, where this doesn't matter, where there isn't a big difference in terms of one country versus another. Sure. And so there's, there's lots of different countries that have a higher risk of corruption. But there's two ways of looking at this issue. There's one by geography, but there's also one by industry. And so you can look at this by industry and say, what's the most corrupt industry in the world? What's the riskiest industry to be doing business in or with? And that's the construction industry. But if you're in energy and resources, you're doing construction work. You don't dig a mine anymore. You build it. And therefore, construction is part and parcel, an integral part of what you do as a business, as a mining entity, and in many cases, an oil and gas entity as well. So you have to look at it both by geography and by industry as well, or the type of work that you're doing. And I know that people in Canada can just look, pick up a newspaper and read any time they want about corruption in the construction industry. So industries that have a higher level of, level of corruption and bribery risk, is it because they have a greater number of government official touch points or is it the nature of the work? What is it about certain sectors that make them at higher risk? Again, excellent point, because keep in mind we're focused on companies doing business outside of Canada. Mm -hmm. So Canadian companies doing business overseas. There is no way you're going to engage in any business activity outside of Canada without having a government touch point. So any government touch point has a risk, an inherent risk of corruption being involved in it. Anything that you're doing with a foreign government official where they can exert any influence on the outcome, there is a risk of corruption. And so it doesn't have to be a contract. Many people just think about public sector contracts or contracting having a risk of corruption. You could be dealing with the tax authorities. You could be dealing with customs or immigration. 
You could be dealing with licensing or permitting. You could be attempting to get a meeting with a government official. And there is an element or there is a potential risk of corruption in that activity. So now that we have a sense of what the risks are or the, the, where the risks show up, what are the consequences? If a company doesn't have the kind of internal controls or the tone from the top in order to avoid corruption and bribery, if they do find that their employees have been bribing someone, have been engaged in corruption, what are the consequences that could befall them? Sure, and I think that many companies are again focused on the sort of the legal consequences yeah. that could impact them. So what is the fine? Will somebody go to jail? But they don't factor into the reputational harm that it does their business. Once they're tagged with a corruption scandal, it's very difficult to move your brand or your reputation away from being associated with that activity. And it takes years and it can take millions of dollars to do it. So in many times the reputational consequences far outweigh any fines or regulatory issues that you have to deal with within that market itself. I think that's an excellent point, certainly from the perspective of EDC as an export credit agency. When there's a company that has a track record, uh, that they have something in their, in their track record as it relates to corruption and bribery, the number of questions that we ask, I can just imagine that times every single one of the financial institutions that they work with. And, and for us, we'll take a look at something that's happened in the last five or 10 years. It's, it's amazing the tail end of a sure. corruption scandal that just follows you for a long time. And, and the damage it does to your ability to operate in, a, in an ethical manner going forward. Many people think that it's the big scandal that caused the, the company harm, or that's how they got into their troubles. It wasn't the big choices that they were making. It was the little choices that they were making along the way. It was that first gift, that first favor, finding uh, a government official's son or daughter a job, getting them into a good school, getting them a scholarship, giving them gifts that are inappropriate when you look back on them. Those little choices or decisions you make interfere with your ability to say no later on. And when they come with their hat in their hands and their hands are out and they want money, once you've said yes once, who do you complain to about being asked for too much later? Peter, thanks very much for this. Maybe as a closing question, what are your top tips for Canadian companies that are going overseas? My absolutely most important top tip would be to do adequate due diligence. Due diligence on the people that you're going to be doing business with in the local market. Um, if that's a joint venture partner, if that's a local supplier, if you're hiring a, a, your own team to go and run the operation for you, a wholly owned subsidiary, it's important to do the due diligence necessary on the ground to understand who you're doing business with, who your suppliers are going to be. Everybody that you do business with can impact your reputation in the manner in which they do business. Because it's so important, my second top tip is due diligence. And it's due diligence around the, the people you actually are hiring. You're, you're going to have people that you put on the ground, and those are going to be people that know the local market. They're going to be people that you actually probably put on the ground, some from Canada as well. But you're going to have to have some local expertise. Do in, in a, a real good job around the due diligence of those individuals. Who have they done business with before? How have they done business before? What experiences do they have? And my third tip would be to understand the environment and the reality that your local employees are working within. For someone coming in from Canada, it's very easy for them, at least relatively easy for them, to say no to a powerful government official. But it's a completely different dynamic for a local employee to make the same statement, to say no to a local government official and a powerful government official. For your local employees, they have to go home at night. They have spouses that work. They have children in schools. They may have extended families. There are pressure points that can be brought to bear. And if you're putting them in the position of always having to be the one that says no, then you're putting yourself at risk that eventually 
they're going to find the right pressure point and they're not going to be able to, to say no. And they may not tell you that they didn't say no. Peter, thank you so much for this. I hope you, as our exporters, small and medium sized, got some good information out of this session. Thank you very much, and specifically, Peter, thank you for actually defining due diligence, which we almost always talk about, but nobody ever gives some good concrete examples around. Thank you. Thank you, Sigrid.